clickbait, clickbait topic. YouTube made his life, or YouTube made his dreams come true. He's like, that's uh, not what my dreams are. Yeah. So introduce yourself. I'm Dan Summer, or Danger Dan, as you guys have seen me on Hoonigan and everything else. And I'm Aaron from Lone Star Drift and Drift Week, and we're here on the last day of Drift Week at the Burn Yard at the new Drift not, uh, Hoonigan headquarters. I am yeah. so tired. Imagine like a two-week drift event. Tire Slayer Studios is what we call it. Wait, Tire, what? Tire Slayer Studios. This is what we're calling that right now. Oh, really? I yeah. thought it was just Hoonigan. Yeah, it was Hoonigan and Tire Slayer Studios. This location. Are there multiple Hoonigans in? No. Okay. This is just. I'm confused. This location is called Tire Slayer. But that Slayer sounds Studio. like y'all are going to franchise it. No, like a bunch it's of not. Stores. It's just we needed something to call the yard because we had the burn yard and we had our old yard and we had. Oh, okay. You know I what I mean? It. I get so it. So just this this area back here. So what I want to talk about is there's so many people within the drift community right now that are making their lives out of this. Yep. And there's very few that make professional lives out of the driving side, but there's a ton that make it out of the media side. Right. I have, uh, you know, Cody Slack over at BC Racing. Yes. Cody, he's, you know, works at the, there's like burnouts everywhere. I don't know what's going on. <laughs> That's so weird. Okay, Cody Slack did it's it. Content, he dude. was a Texas guy. Um, Tyler Capper, if you know Tyler Capper, mm -hmm. he works for Larry Chin. Yep. Um, who else? Danny Puckett was working for RTR's media. We've got so many people working like on the media side, it's almost greater than the professional side of sure. racing. I mean, it kind of feels when like it sometimes. You go it's a whole new When you go outlet. to a driver's meeting, it doesn't matter if it's Formula D or some private event, you always have more media guys now. Mm -hmm. And that was kind of a crazy change for me, right? Because normally you'd have like Thank you. four or five, maybe yes. 10 media guys, mm -hmm. and then uh, 60 drivers. Now it's 60 media guys and 50 drivers, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's, it's kind of crazy to be split. And all the drivers are media guys now, too. Yep. That's so weird. I had iced tea delivered. <laughs> I, I didn't pee once today, and I was just like, oh my it's god, I'm going to die. <laughs> I probably need water. So let's keep going on that theme. Um, you were originally a fabricator, correct? Yep. And how did you end up as a media person? Because that's totally not the direction you would think to get to like Hoonigan. Because right. again, I think a lot of people think of Hoonigan as a dream job, and that's kind of where I'm leading this conversation. Yeah. So keep going. Tell so, me about your past, like, how you get like, to all the stuff. Really, I, we had our own shop. We worked out of necessity to build our own drift cars. Mm -hmm. And we didn't have anybody next to us that was like a really well-known shop that could, to, could help out. So me and my buddy Mike, we uh, worked on all of our own cars. And we got good at it. And more people, more people wanted work from us. So it was like, we should make this a job. And we did. So it became fabrication and stuff like that. And then fast forward years later, I worked with uh, Dean Carney, Andy Gray, uh, Peter, all those, all those guys formed the drift and just touring the country and actually the world and, mm -hmm. and formed the drift and just crewing with those guys. And then fast forward a few more years, uh, came over here to a job interview with Hoonigan. And Before that, didn't you go work in Japan for a while? Too? I did, yeah. I worked with Andy Gray um, at Power Vehicles, so stayed at Ebisu. You'd come over for a couple, uh, mm -hmm. couple festivals and we, we got down, we watched uh, fielding Punt a, punt a wall really hard in the 33. What the f is he doing? Yeah. All right, let's take the car away from him. Um, yeah, and that was that was good hang times, man. It was like you know four months for me out there, mm -hmm. and that's to me was like the dream come true. You know, that's drifting as much as possible, and you know work work six days a week just to drift one full day. And that was really fun. And then come over here, you know, after I had to leave Japan, the visa's up, and come back and work with uh, Dean Carney on his team and toured with him for a couple seasons. And then came to Hoonigan here, and Brian's like, when can you start? And I was like, today. He's like, get on it. So, so you came in as a fabricator, fabricator. not a media star? Not at all. How did you end up being a media star? I think it was just a kind of a a fluke, sort of, because they had me film what I was building. And I think, you know, the dynamic of me in the garage and getting along with some of the guys and uh, the videographers and everything else, it made really good content. And, mm -hmm. and they liked that, so they wanted to do more build content. So then I ended up doing a lot more build content. And then they realized we're going to push this to another channel and we'll be just build content. So we built a lot of build content that I don't think they really saw before. Because mm -hmm. I've had builders before, but I don't think anybody was really willing to be on camera or, you know, some guys are kind of old and crusty and don't want to talk to a camera or stuff like that. I think it just kind of worked out that I can speak to 
speak to the camera and I'm not afraid of it and mm -hmm. it just kind of was a, a fluke that it worked out and and people enjoyed it so keep going I'm gonna look up something for you while I talk keep, yeah, keep I talking. think I think the the more that people enjoyed it and they saw the views go up then they wanted to make more and more build content we built more shows around it so we got better builds then and we went from building shark cart and shit car on up to building you know the diesel camaro that we have today which is a pretty insane build when you think about it mm -hmm. but going 200 mile an hour in a diesel car is, is kind of wild and it's something that we had never really done in this facility before we started out with barely any tools here too it's like just nothing now we have a full sh fab shop we have multiple lifts and everything's geared towards builds and, and making more build content but now I've kind of taken a step back from all the fabrication work and I'm just strictly hosting mm -hmm. so I'm here to just host shows and, and jump in I'll jump in on a build here and there but it's mainly uh, just this kind of stuff having you guys over have some fun we talk and we bullshit we go out and uh, film some drag racing and there's all kinds of different things we do now. so I just checked your Instagram and you have like I think 137 I have a really short memory like a nap yeah. 137,000 followers mm -hmm. which is more than most of the Formula D guys correct yeah. um, you get to do all these crazy media projects and you probably get approached by companies to like put the parts on your own For cars sure. and do all these different things For sure. and you also work inside of a huge studio which gives you the insight of what most of the drivers in Formula D don't even have access to from the inside of how the industry works. Correct. Um, so you have not only your own distribution medium, which is Instagram. Do you run your own YouTube channel? I don't. You're like, eh. I, you I, could. I, I probably whatever. will, but I mean, there's so much going on here. Yeah, there's no problem. But I mean, there's other Somebody stuff that I do. I still do my own build stuff. I, I built mm -hmm. the Miata, I built my S14, and you know, I filmed all that stuff. I haven't put it on my YouTube because I was like, I don't know. I don't know if anybody wants to watch it or not, but it might be something I do. Um, mm -hmm. Just because I still continue to do drifting and I still continue to build my own stuff. Mm -hmm. And it's nothing to me to film it. It's just kind of set it up. It's, it's muscle memory now, right? Mm -hmm. You set stuff up and you just kind of do it. So it's something that I've thought about for sure. Um, but yeah, yeah, I definitely have my own Instagram. And yeah, I'm just saying, like, it, it, they built For you up and everything, stuff. and you're doing better off from the marketing side of a lot of those other right. people, and you took a very non-traditional path. Yeah. And you're doing super well, and you're involved in so many different things, and you're just getting so much knowledge and everything. I was just thinking, like, some of these Formula D drivers, the, you know, mid-pack ones and stuff should almost just, it sounds silly, get a job here and have, like, their car in the build channel or something and just right. build their car. They would almost do better off than just randomly doing their own stuff. Well, That'd I be hilarious. I see a you lot know, like, of guys... Does that, I see a lot of guys trying to do stuff like that now. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just what we do today, everything is consumed on social media mm -hmm. or YouTube, like... If you don't have that in your racing program, you're gonna fail mm -hmm. because you have to have eyes on it. You got to be able to sell to your sponsors. You have to have the views, and I mean, a lot of drivers now, it's just you can't show up to an event and just hope that that's the best, right? You have to do other stuff. You have to do outside work on social media, keeping up with your builds, keeping up with your fans, and I've seen a lot more drivers start to do that now. It's just finding the avenue to do it. So I think it is a good, like a good. Thing for people to come out here and do the show like say you do a build breakdown bring your car out here it gets you maximum exposure you mm -hmm. know that could get 500,000 views to eyes that weren't watching you before and that can bump up your Instagram that can bump up everything and that help your program mm -hmm. so that's why a lot of guys come out here and shred the living crap out of their cars because they want to have those big views and and that's something you can sell to your sponsors so it's a good start we've seen a lot of guys start out like this and then branch off and do their own thing and it's, it's worked out well for them. But you look at guys like, uh, you know, Forsberg and Turk and all those guys, they're doing their own thing and they, they're they self-sufficient. Yeah, yeah self-sufficient and killing it, yeah. And then you have, you know, Adam and Chelsea and Vaughn, like they're gonna be a powerhouse because of that. You know, Adam's got a massive following and you have, you know, Chelsea and Vaughn who are just gonna be unstoppable in the cars and, and the racing program and teaching Adam how to get into that. You know, it's like blending both of those together. And mm -hmm. I think we'll see more mergers like that in the future because it's gonna have to be. You know, I, I, I think if you're not into it, you're gonna get left behind. Yeah, I, I couldn't imagine trying to deal like as an, as a contender in FD dealing with like the budget of some of these guys, such as the RTR team that are just killing it on so many fronts. That'd be so difficult, especially yeah. like, 
Atom combined with RTR and things like that, you're oh, just yeah. like, oh my God, the budget. Yeah, that's gonna be a powerhouse, you know? Like, they have everything laid out for them, you know? We have Vaughn's experience, mm -hmm. and just everything with their team is fantastic. So Adam's gonna have a stellar car. Mm -hmm. He's got a stellar teammate to learn from with Chelsea. So I see his driving going up very rapidly. Mm -hmm. But you know who's who's next on that forefront? Who who else is going to come up and, and have some kind of merger? What other teams are going to combine? And because it's going to be hard to compete with people like that, you know. I'm going to give you a quick choose your own adventure now for the whole thing. Do you want to talk about the differences between like Formula D and like D1 stuff in Japan builds that you were working on when you were there, and what you saw for the construction quality and how they you know themed their builds versus American stuff, or would you like to talk about? Uh, I've just picked these things randomly. Mm, your best experience working at Hoonigan and like the craziest thing that, you know, gave you the most joy and excitement working over here. You know, it's a cool a story, one. like you can just tell me a story. A story? Or do you want to talk about the differences between fabrication and like the race cars between the United States and Japan? I actually think that's a kind of an interesting thing. The uh, Japanese versus Japanese American. versus Let's American. do that one. Because, uh, you know, the little time that I spent over there, mm -hmm. it was very eye-opening. It's mind-blowing, fast. It's, it's, it's <laughs> eye-opening, yeah. And, it, you know, just from growing up with it and, and watching all these Japanese cars, you're like, man, these are the sickest cars that I've ever seen. And then you get over there, and you're like, no, they're not. <laughs> they're really not. <laughs> like, some of them are, like, spit and tape held together. And you're like, how does this work? And how do these guys drive so hard on this setup? Even seeing more of, like, the grassroots cars, like what we would have at the festivals. Mm -hmm. You know, like, when you're at Ebisu and you see these guys just stacking spacers. It's like, this stuff doesn't happen over here. We all have, everybody over here now has, you know, a fairly good knuckle kit and suspension setup. And then Japan is just like, these dudes have cut knuckles and spacers. And it's pretty insane to see like the driving and capability these guys have and the faith that they have in their cars. I was amazed at, say like an American pro team would stitch weld a chassis, powder coat the chassis, put a crazy cage in it that's, you know, almost like some insane race car build. They're doing all these crazy things to the car with lots of engineering and thought and everything else. And then you go look at like the winning D1 car at the time and it's literally like a Cusco bolt-in cage <laughs> yeah. with like a stock SR. passenger seat with <laughs> yeah. like no safety gear in it with bolt-in door bars. And you're just like, what? You, you, yeah. You're just like, that's crazy. And of course their cars have now advanced beyond that and stuff. Well, but what's course. the reason do you think? Was it because their fabrication tools were <laughs> terrible? Yeah, I think I think part of it is like, well, the there was a lot more people involved in drifting back in the day. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of, you know, faded off. So they don't have too many people who are working on cars anymore. Mm -hmm. And I noticed that when I went over to work with Andy, you know, speaking of building an American car, Andy with the JZX100, um, he was building basically an American pro car, but I was doing it in-house in Japan to help finish it up. And Andy Seehausen's the one who got me into it. Um, he connected Andy Gray and myself, and uh, Andy started the build and I helped finish it up. And then vice versa, I started one in Japan and then Andy finished it up and now Andy built a whole nother chassis, but that car was brilliant for what was over there. So the level of work that we put into it, both Andy and myself, you know, is like these guys don't see TIG welding very often. They don't see like really crazy tube work and, and having everything gutted out of it. And that car was painted all the underneath and inside candy paint, it was just gorgeous. So bringing that to Tokyo Auto Salon, it was just so many people around that car and just focused on, you know, just some of the engineering behind it and then also the fab work that went into it. And it was just blowing people's minds. And I think it did help bring up some of the caliper of race cars. Um, but you have guys coming from all over. You have Mad Mike doing the same thing and bringing a car over. And I think more people see that and, and watch Formula Drift and it gets a little bit more built, more built. And you see Daigo's cars, they're all insane. They're mental. And I don't think there's any rules for Daigo Saito, is there? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> he built some well, crazy like, stuff. The, the rule book's pretty loose for that guy, so. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's, it's wild crazy to see. car we were looking at, and there's just like no structure to the car. You know, the JZX 2000 pound yeah. car or whatever. Sitting 1, on top of the engine. Yeah, it was crazy. I don't even understand the rule book for that car. There was like no there, rear of the car. There's his own rule book, yeah. I'm, I'm fairly certain. But everything else you see out there, it's not, like, it's not crazy. 
Over here, every car is a thousand horsepower. Everybody's gripped up to the moon, and they're getting that way though in D1 now, aren't they're they? They're starting to, yeah. Mm -hmm. So you see more sequentials. You see, you know, cars are starting to bobble a little bit more, have a little more suspension travel, and mm -hmm. and a lot more grip. And uh, I think the driving style is starting to change a little bit, but it's, you know, Japan's very different than here. You know, it's over here, big windy, left foot braking stuff, whereas you know, Jeff. Japanese drivers are all flicking into the corner, and that's mm -hmm. kind of how I was raised in drifting and seeing that stuff. It's when you're not powering through, when you're building cars over here for the Hooning and stuff, is it more like comedy cars sometimes, where they're just like themed builds, like say the Diesel Land Speed Record car, when yeah. it was one of those? It was already a drag car that was like super fast, wasn't it? No, this was a I thought V6, it was one of those it was V6 Camaro cars. Oh, was it? Yeah, we bought this thing on Craigslist for like. I don't know, two grand. Oh, somebody told me it was one of those Copo ones no, or whatever we, it was. We had the guys at Copo come help us out with uh, setting up the rear end. Oh, so that's we have, what I heard. We have the, the turnkey performance um, rear end set up that's mm -hmm. tied into the roll cage. And that was to keep everything straight and to take the torque. Because <laughs> they're like three, 4,000 horsepower drag cars. Mm -hmm. But we have what could be 2,000 foot-pounds of torque, and we don't even know. It's nuts. So it's just a big shock and load for for everything, it was like this. This is going to need some serious work to keep that rear end in. We got How did a winner's you come up with ten the, and a half. The concept of like building the car like that at all, like why put these guys came up with it? it. Really? So I, I had nothing to do with that. They were just like, all right, man. You're like guys. I don't our, know about this. Here's our idea. And actually, the original idea was to go into a 350Z. Oh They wanted God. to do a, a it Duramax. I was, I was like, arguing so hard. Like this You're can't. Like, I don't want to build this. It cannot happen. It can't physically fit. I measured the engine bay. And I measured the motor. I was like. The shock towers were 31 inches wide, and I was like, this motor's 35 inches wide. Mm -hmm. Like, it's it can't fit. And then the height of it was 39 inches. I was like, it's gonna be right here. You're gonna be staring at the back of the head. Like, you, you, it won't work. It's too much custom fab work. So I went into uh, a junkyard and just started measuring engine bays. Mm -hmm. And what I really wanted to do was a Dodge Magnum. I thought that would be a pretty cool car for a land speed car, and I thought that would have a huge engine bay, but it really doesn't. It's almost the same size as a 350Z. Oh, that's weird. <laughs> yeah. Oh, because they're V6, like little things yeah. from the factory. Yeah, so measured up the Camaro, and it was, I was like, this is the only thing it could physically fit weird. without modifying the front end, and that was the whole thing. We didn't want to tube the front and stuff like that. We wanted mm -hmm. to keep it in a stock car and just build a gnarly cage, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But it was a wild build. I mean, I, I knew nothing about diesel when I started it, and I, that's why I was not confident in doing it. And I made it apparent that I was not confident in anything <laughs> that I was doing. Um, and I learned a lot along the way, and I learned that the diesel community, they pretty much hate each other, all of them. <laughs> Explain that. So, I saw the Gail Banks thing. Is that what you're referring to? Nah, sort of. Like, okay. Gail was kind of past the fact. It was more trying to gather knowledge on builds and stuff like that. And guys are really touchy on who they go with for fueling or, or tuning or head work and stuff like that. Um, and then also the knowledge between turbos and turbo setups and, and how everything is built. I had no idea. I've never done a compound turbo setup before. So trying to bounce ideas off of people, it was just like, no, you can't do that. And then somebody else would be like, yeah, we do it all the time. And then I'm just like hearing like contradicting arguments. Mm -hmm. I was like, I don't know who to trust. So I actually talked to uh, the turbo company and they were like, well, this is how it has to work. So I went with that. <laughs> <laughs> so, was it Garrett or who was it? No, it was uh, Precision. Okay. So I went, went to Precision and I was like, hey, I'm doing a compound setup and I drew out what I thought was the right idea. And they're like, yeah, that's it. I was like, okay. So I still kind of know how a turbo works. That's good. Um, and we just kind of went off of that and it works. I mean, it makes 80 pounds of boost. Whew. Some really thick, you know, I was going to say, how do you keep couplers on it? Uh, it's all the, all the vibrant ones, like the big heavy-duty clamps. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. It doesn't it's, blow it's couplers very, or anything? Not at all. Great. But it's so intimidating. When we first did it on the engine dyno, and you <gasps> hear that thing swell up, and you see the intercooler lift off the ground, I was like, oh, my God, is this just going to blow to pieces? Jeez. It's like, this is really... Uh, kind of stressful when you've just welded everything. You're like, oh boy, I hope I did this good. <laughs> Not only is it it's our lives at stake, but uh, yeah, it's kind of terrifying. And driving is terrifying. It's oh, you got to drive it? Yeah. How I, fast did you go? 145 and a quarter mile. Mm -hmm. But I, it, it takes a long time to get into gear, um, just to get it going. It's such a gradual 
Because it's a land speed car? Yeah, so, and the gearing's really tall. We're set to go like 215-ish mm -hmm. top speed. Um, so the engagement has to be really soft because we have so much torque, it just lights the tires up. Even still, with this crazy soft engagement, you shift it into the next gear, lights them right up. Is it manual? It's, no, it's a, okay, it's it's a four-speed auto, yeah. Mm. So, just click it back. Which auto? Uh, it's a 4L80, but it's a built 4L80 crazy from one. Monster Trains. Yeah, huh. the, it's a custom setup. These guys did like 3,000 horsepower drag cars. Mm. And uh, they were worried about it taking the torque, but it, it has not had any issues with that. Cool. Actually, any of the driveline, nothing's had any problems. So it's a really stout motor. I, and I can't believe it's like 1,000 horsepower, 1,500 foot-pounds of torque, mm -hmm. 80 pounds of boost, and it just takes a beating. There's no fans on it. Like, just overheat the piss out of it and it still works. That's did like a 200 mile an hour burnout at, at uh, the burn yard. Oh God. I gassed myself out and I thought I was gonna die. Oh I got God. out before the car stopped. Like, I had to get out. Like, it was just too much smoke inside. I got out and the car's still in first gear and rolling and everybody's like, stop! I was like, I'm not getting in there. <laughs> just Jesus. let it hit something. But uh, we stopped it, but it was pretty crazy. <laughs> I can't, so we're here at the burnyard today and half the time we're choking on smoke. Like, I guess it's also a longer session than y'all normally do. Or oh, I yeah. guess y'all also film a lot of episodes in one day though. We do, um, but it's not consecutive like this. You know, oh. like, there's a walk around, there's build up to it and there's talking and then maybe five, 10 minutes of shred. Mm -hmm. And then a couple hours downtime, then a couple, couple minutes of shred. You mm -hmm. know, it's, it's very seldom that we have car after car after car after car after car. Mm -hmm. And that's where it's just gonna linger all day. It's just really nowhere to escape here too. It's, there's no safe place to oh, hide. Yeah. The best place to sit is where all the smoke collects. Yeah, the best place to stay out of harm's way is where you're gonna get choked out by smoke. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's one of the most difficult things to deal with. Has your brain started to really wrap around the whole Hoonigan model and stuff? Cause we had us to do some stuff with them a few years ago where I don't remember if it was Herder who called me up and they're like, hey, we want to shoot some episodes with you in Austin because we'll be there for some... Rally cross. Ro red Rooster or like some type of who Rooster knows? Productions. Who knows what we did. Anyways, it was something like that and I was like, oh, I'll get you a road course, I'll do this. And they're like, no, we want the littlest, junkiest place that's as tight as humanly possible. <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, what? And then they rented out this place and we get there and I'm just like, this is insane. I was like, this is, I don't understand what's going on. And it took me a while to realize that they're creating such a small space that like you as the presenter can be a hype man and you're like in the middle of it the entire time and the right. car never gets too fast or gets out of control. The camera work doesn't have to be all over the place. It's a super repeatable thing. And then to have it all at your own venue yeah. so that everyone like travels to you, like this is all genius yeah, from a YouTube perspective. This it's is It's good because, I mean, you take out a lot of the danger part of it by keeping them in a small box, mm -hmm. especially for our shooters and the spots that we have. And then you get kind of used to it. You know, you know where you can be, you have the layout. <laughs> You know, like once it's smoked out, you still have kind of an idea of where you can be, which does get scary. Sometimes you get smoked out and you can't see where you're at. I'm usually the one wrangling out here like a bullfighter and uh, dancing with some of the cars, but it's it's different with whatever driver you have. Sometimes you have a lot of trust in a guy, like I know Mesker very well, so I know Mesker's not gonna hit me. Um, <laughs> it's always the ones you know. <laughs> <laughs> it's always the ones you know though. Um, but yeah, sometimes it gets so rowdy you have no idea. But it is nice to have everything in our own space and you know, be able to have shows and, and people over and have you guys here to do this because we've had an awesome day, right? Mm -hmm. It was pretty fun. We just jammed out all day. If this is your job, this is not a bad job. It's not a bad job, yeah. Although sometimes I still get overwhelmed and you'll still sit there and you just like sit down and you're like not looking at everything going on. And you're like, oh man, I should be really excited, but like, I am worn out. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think- It's so overwhelming. A lot of it, like, we're so jaded because we see it all the time. Yeah. And, you know, it might be really sick to somebody else who's like, yeah, I don't know, seen it. But it's still exciting. You know, we still get out here and in, in this small space, that's kind of what makes it exciting because you don't know what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. Even guys out here are some fantastic drivers, right? There's some of them are really good drivers. But you come out here, you black out, you lose your mind, you don't know what you're doing, and you just crash the shit out of your car. And I'm guilty of it, I've done it too. Every time I get in my car, I don't 
I kind of have an idea of what I want to do. And then after the first kind of couple turns, you're like, whatever, freestyle. And that's when you get caught up in smashing your car. And I knew that was shit. how it was, so I laid out a track and everything, and people still did that shit. Yeah, you were the first one, though. Oh, you, you just went do anything? rogue. Yeah, you went rogue. But I feel confident in all that. You yeah, know, like it's I a know. V8 car, second <laughs> gear, you just cruise around. It's not like the turbo cars and stuff. I'm watching people in turbo cars, like, full struggle out. busting. Full out. Yeah. Get back in it, fall And they're out. having to do it in first gear, so they have, like, no ability to, like, control the you car. You can't get the speed. Oh. Yeah. That's Super low looking. angle. And then you finally get speed, and you have to slap. Yeah. Spool back up. But, yeah, it's... And for the audience that's not watching, or not... They're watching. Yeah, they're watching. I don't know. I'm really tired. This is two weeks of this crap. <laughs> yeah. um, for the audience that's watching, at Burnyard, when we did it the first time, and also... This is the fourth one, so we've been to the Burnyard for the first and fourth drift week. All the damage on the trip gets done here. All of it. All the damage. It's yeah. just smallest place, and like we are terrified to drive here. Because the first drift week, we put only five-car tandem, if you remember that. Yeah, oh yeah. Five-car tandem is, I don't know what we were thinking. That was the dumbest thing ever. <laughs> and like for me, I'm like, yeah, we'll be fine. This is going to be great. And then like... I don't, I didn't even try this time. Yeah. It was a mess if we would have done that. The first time we got two cars in here, it was like, this is weird. <laughs> you know, there's, it, cause the transitions are weird and everything's really not moving. Yeah. Nothing's moving. Even these things are hard. This is gonna mess your car up and we saw it today, but. Oh, the cars go under it, by the way. Yeah. That blew my mind. I was watching and I was like, how do you get away with that? <laughs> yeah. A car took a mirror off on one. I know, that's wild. That it's just crazy. perfect height. Yeah. But yeah, there, Everything else is really hard, and you're gonna you're gonna mess your car up, and you get just confidence. You come out, you get confidence, and then you got a whole bunch of people watching you going, and then you just get fixated on things. I think that's part of it too. Is is like you know the fixation. You look at stuff, and you're like, I'm gonna go towards that, and then you hit that. That's mm -hmm. just what it is. You're not looking at where you're going. You're focused on ah, oh, that object looks fun to go around, and then you end up hitting that object. I was gonna say also like hitting that object. I saw a dude pick up a barrier and take it around <laughs> the track for like three laps. I had never seen that in my life. Not only did he do that, like what is the freak accident, that he lost the barrier and then picked up another one immediately. Yeah, that made no sense. <laughs> I've never Just seen a car, inside. it was an IS300 and there was one of these full barriers behind me like off the back of the car at a big angle, yeah. just driving it around. I don't even think the thing, the thing, the thing was touching the ground. Yeah, you can he, hear me slurring words. He, he had no idea. He had yeah. no idea that even happened, and that's why I, I kept running after him. I was like, I might get hit by this barrier, but it's totally worth it, because when are you ever going to see this again? And then he lost one, picked one back up, and kept doing it. I was like, there's no way. That's there's nuts. no way that happened. So what's next for you? Because it seems like the whole Hoonigan was kind of like accidental for you getting all this fame. Yeah, I mean, it is fame. Yeah. Have people know you around the world and probably stop you in public and everything, which for is sure. rad. Um, what are you gonna do with it? What are you gonna do for like the next five years? You're just gonna hang out here and be a part I mean, of this? There's a part of this for me, but there's definitely more for me. Mm -hmm. I'd, I'd like to do, so I wanna keep driving. I wanna do a lot more events. I'm trying to get my cars at a better, better place so I can drive the you know, grid life, final bout, stuff like that, youth Drift guys. week. I'm gonna drive as much drift week as I can. That's why I built the Miata. Really? Yes. Why That's weren't why you I there for the whole trip? Because I just got it done. Oh. I was trying to so hard and I couldn't get, there was a couple issues that I had, and some of them being finding a tuner mm -hmm. uh, that was available. And uh, yeah, it just kind of came together late. But at least I made it to today, and I still have a, another issue as with the diff, but I'll get it all sorted by the next one. But that's why I have the roof rack and everything else, and mm -hmm. I've got it pretty dialed to fit all of my tools. I figured out how much I can bring. I've been planning on it for all a while. Right. I was, I was well, number five is supposed here. to be in May on the East Coast. So that's you need a far to make one. it. That's a far one. <laughs> I love that. That's immediately like, well, I'm not going to be doing that one. That's <laughs> No, but far. I would like to because I, How those are a lot, of, your car? a lot of tracks that I haven't driven. Mm -hmm. That's the whole point of the yeah. trip, too. Because I've driven all these tracks out here, mm -hmm. but I still wanted to do all of them. I missed muscle, man. By I, the way, I it was a completely that. different experience when you're with us because, like, we're bombing through the water tower part of like horse thief we're linking the entire thing there's no starting yeah. line so like all the all the local drivers are like i've never driven like this at any yeah. of these tracks like you you get to do whatever you want and you trust us there's like there's not a flagger stopping me every lap and making me sit in line i'm like yeah, yeah no we trust you that you got accepted on this trip i did all of the like vouch process to make sure i can trust you right yeah um, yeah that's, that's oh and did difference. hurt actually even try to come 
Did he get Very, a car even? Did he put any effort into it? He broke all of his cars. Did he really? Yeah, yeah, they're all broken right now, but he's in rebuild mode, and he actually had to go pick up his Skyline. So this Is week, Skyline? he just got a R32. Oh, cool. He's driving it to Boston right now as we speak. Why Boston? Because somebody's going to help him rebuild it and make it all super nice. Oh, weird. Yeah. That's the thing, by the way. He got to the point where he's famous. You're probably a few more years of, like, till you're at Hurt level. Yeah, Hurt's And big. then just, like, people are like, here's solid gold wheels, Dan. Yeah. <laughs> I doubt it. <laughs> I don't know, man. Yeah. You just got to, like, play the hype man part. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot to be said about what we do on YouTube and, and that we definitely have an advantage for getting stuff from different companies, but it's also like another secondary job, yeah. you know? And that sometimes can be stressful when, you know, you just wanna go have fun with your friends and go drive. It's like, it's kinda work at some point where it's like, I have to film this, I have to do this today. And, you know, it, I, every every post has to tag all the sponsors and everything else, and you have to really well think everything out. Mm -hmm. You can't just kinda relax and have fun. And it's kinda wanna take a step back on some of the things and have a little bit more fun and hit some more grassroots events and just kind of sit in the back and drive again, you know? Because it kind of gets a little bit of a pain in the ass. But other than that, I mean, it is kind of nice to have cool stuff, but, you know. It's nice to be able to travel around the world and have all these experiences that normal sure. normies don't get to. <laughs> I mean, like, no, when you go to Japan, you spent time at Ebisu, you go do all these projects with Hoonigan, you learn so much. Yeah. You're like, oh, I don't need that, or I do need that, or that's a complete waste of time, or like, this is really neat, or like, I don't want a supercar, I've driven one. They're just a pain in the butt and they depreciate like yeah. crazy, or they do this or that and they cost me money. I, like, I you just get that, all that, that out part, of your system. That part is pretty cool, because mm -hmm. you figure out, like, yeah, I'm, I'm not into supercars. It's mm -hmm. not my thing. It's not my jam. We, and luckily for this job, we've been able to do cool stuff like that mm -hmm. and been taken all over the place. But I feel like I learned a lot more when I was just traveling around and drifting, like going down to drive with you guys in Texas mm -hmm. and road trip down there, you know, in my S14 with 12 tires in the car. And Did it's... you come with the crew when you came with Dami and everybody? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, I remember yeah, yeah. exactly when you were there. Yeah. Dami and those guys broke and we think we moved their car somewhere. That wasn't the year I brought Yokoi and everybody out, was it? Uh, no, Yokoi wasn't there. Okay. Yeah, but we, I missed that one. Actually, I missed the Yokoi one, but before then. Yeah. Yeah. You we, came out with Dami and his brother and yeah. all that stuff, and they mm -hmm. broke a car, and I think we of stored course. it for him. Yep. Yeah. I think, okay, I remember exactly yeah, that time. Yeah, Koopa and a couple other guys, and yeah. we had a good shred sesh, but oh, wait. we went from Atlanta. Was Josh down. the one with the pink KA car? Yep. Uh, okay, I do remember. That's crazy that yeah. I can remember the car and the color yeah. and all that stuff and exactly what you were driving <laughs> on the day. Yeah. I, I can't remember anybody's name on Drift Week, but I remember your stupid car like 20 years ago. Yeah. That was literally 12 years ago, probably. Probably. That's it was a crazy. long time ago. But I'm saying, like, we traveled all over. And that year, specifically for me, like, yeah. I drove everywhere. I did Formula Drift Atlanta. And then the next week, I did, like, another competition in uh, Indiana. Like, mm -hmm. same weekend. You mm -hmm. know, like, three drift events in a row that were all over the place. And a car that I daily drove with a roll cage in it <laughs> with tires that I had stashed at people's houses and stuff like that. And broke stuff, fixed it, drove home. And it was... You know, I have to go to work on Monday in the same car, so it has to work. Jesus. So, yeah, I think I learned a lot on the road doing that and meeting everybody across the country, and then even making it to Japan with Formula Drift. Like, there was a lot that I lived before mm -hmm. the Hoonigan stuff. So you know, put yourself in the right place, kind of thing. Mm -hmm. It's like you just keep doing it, and you're gonna find yourself in some place where. You know, I was like, I've met all these people. I knew Hurt from uh, Drift Mechanics back in the day. That's Oh, Drift big, Mechanics? That's yeah. something I never hear about. Yeah. Andy Sapp and all those guys. Yeah, Marty, yeah. Marty, Marty. Yep, yeah. So we, you know, we've been friends since then. And mm -hmm. uh, we've always hung out on the internet. Hurt wasn't in Drift Mechanics, yeah. was he? For sure. Really? Yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah. Yeah, so that's how I know He him. didn't live there. But Hurt was Atlanta. on every, he lived everything. He in Florida, right? He was in Florida then. Okay. Yeah. I didn't know they had, like, chapters. It's not really a chapter. It was just, yeah. it, they were all based in Atlanta. Yeah. And we just kind of found our way in somehow because we were traveling and. That's hilarious. We found cool people. I met Andy in St. Louis, Andy Sapp, yeah. and uh, Aaron Sanford. And those guys kind of got me in. For everybody, this might get really niche and like kind of like <laughs> inside story, but Drift Mechanics was one of the original drift groups out in Atlanta. 
and they had their own forum and it was just very early days and Andy Sapp was one of the first guys who had like he had an E46 325i drift car yeah. way before like anybody had a newer too. chassis like that yeah this was probably 2004 2003 in between, in between. 2005 we were st striving from 2005 to uh, like 2009. Mm -hmm. It was like when that forum was pretty big and then it started to kind of tail yeah. off after that. So there, it was a pretty tight-knit group of people a long time ago. Yep. And the early, early days of drifting. So that's all. That's yeah. drift and mechanics. Yeah, that's, and that's funny. You know, just it from, was spelled funny too, if I remember Yeah, correctly. of course it was. Yeah. yeah. Mechanics. It's so it funny. With a K. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but uh, it, it was definitely cool. Um, and meeting those people and then Traction Optional with Forrest Lester and those guys and just yeah, traveling, traveling all over. And I've met so many people through drifting that have put me in different places. Now we see each other in different spaces and you know, you're seeing Wicknick here and stuff like that. It's like, you know, we've known each other for so long, mm -hmm. but it's funny to kind of meet again and different stuff and Dan Brockett and mm -hmm. all that stuff. It's like, we all knew of each other back then. We just couldn't really get to each other, and sometimes we would, but it's funny to see what everybody's doing, you know, with Dan doing stunt driving and stuff like that. It's like, it's cool to see where everybody had branched off, and people are doing well everywhere, doing mm -hmm. their own things. You know, Tyler from Drift Mechanics has Coral Works, and that shop is really sick, and just seeing those guys bring that up, and Andy Sapp is now doing his own thing on the road, and... Uh, I haven't heard about Andy Sapp in forever, though. Yeah, man, he kind of just went off the grid, and that's cool for him. But he'll pop up at a drift event every once in a while. It's like seeing a, uh, a unicorn, and you're like, yes, Andy's here. <laughs> and it kind of brings a hype, you know? But uh, Andy was one of the very talented early, uh, whatchamacallits, videographers yeah. within drifting. He had, like, a Canon mini DV camera, the XL1 or whatever, with, like, modified to accept 35-millimeter glass on this huge thing and stuff. Uh, he was very influential with the Slide America, yeah, Slide America video and all these other things. And then they did Keep Drifting Fun with Will and Josh. Uh, oh, he was part of that? Yep. I didn't he was realize part of that. that as well. So Will and Josh kind of heated the whole I thing. I just saw Will and Josh in that, really. Yeah. You know, I didn't see Andy in there. I yeah, Andy had a, a big role in that as well. So it's kind of cool to see cool. those guys all work together. And they're, we're all good friends still. And we hang out all the time. But uh, I, my S14 is actually Will Rogie's old car. Oh, that's yeah. cool. We have the same body kit as Josh, which was made to to match Hobo's car. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of kind of a rad little thing too. So so much insider information <laughs> yeah. that none of you guys understand. Nobody I'm knows sorry. this old school stuff. But this is cool. You're hearing all this old stuff about Dan that he probably doesn't talk about. Not much. Yeah. yeah. It's not He's just much. a hype man. Like woo. Yeah. as people are doing burnouts out here. Yeah, people are like, oh, By man. the way, I could not imagine that this would be a thing, like back in 04, that like people would be watching, like millions of people watching burnouts. Right. And like a little tiny box. <laughs> I would just be like, what are you talking about? <laughs> I don't get it. Yeah. Yeah, it's so strange. Have like a professional burnout box. I uh, know. That it, people like probably fly cars from around the world to do burnouts they in do. for media purposes. They do. Oh, they do? Yeah. Who flew a car in? Um, let's see. Well, I mean, on a different level, James and Peter flew their cars in and flew them out. But some people have already but just for a been, whole season. They've been here, like flew it over here, and they're like, "Oh, we'll just do this." But it's funny to see like this versus that. The drag racing show, mm -hmm. people will come from anywhere for that. Really? They want to they want to race on that show for whatever reason. Everybody wants to race the unicorn, and nobody realizes how fast that car really is. <laughs> <laughs> like, bring it on! It's just you're not gonna beat it. Really? Why? It's just fast. It's just so fast. Just so much power and so much like it's transmission, traction. so much all-wheel drive. Yeah, I mean, we're talking sevens on the street. What? Yeah, I didn't realize that. Somewhere like that. Don't That's tell crazy. anybody how fast it really is, but it's it's about like that. What would it be on like a prep surface? No just idea. Like a bomb? I would just blow stuff up. I'm yeah. sure. <laughs> There's a, it would just shit axles or something. So that's wild. Yeah. All right. Is there anything you want to say or talk about before we get off? Because we're uh, just kind of rambling for fun. Yeah, we're just rambling. But that's we're just fun. catching up on old times. I'm glad you guys came out. I'm glad I got to witness it. I'm sorry I couldn't make it. I was so pissed. Yeah. I brought my car. At least I made the last thing, the chill out mode. But I definitely want to go to the next one if I can make it. I'm trying to build this car solid so I have no issues and I can run all the drift week. But yeah, I look forward to having fun with you guys in the future. Is it caged? It is. Oh, cool. Yeah. Yeah, to run English Town and stuff. And I won't drive a Miata, on, especially a fast Miata, yeah. on track without, without a, cage. a cage. Yeah. 
I mean, it was like, I got in the car and immediately felt like I'm gonna get hurt. So I was like, I'm going to build a roll cage today. You know, like I, I was already uncomfortable when I got it. I was like, I don't feel like driving this. This needs a roll bar, so. Crazy. Yeah. I, I also feel like I'm gonna like instantly die in a turbo Miata. <laughs> I had a turbo Miata and you're just like driving on the street. You're like, I might as well be on a motorcycle. <laughs> it is, yeah. it is. Nobody sees you. Okay, well yeah. thank you so much for taking the time to chat with us and no stuff. Um, I look forward to like the next chapter of what you're doing Yeah. because I was just like chatting with you one day at Ebisu and hanging out and like, we you were know, like blah 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 blah. Help! He was helping me with something. Yeah. And then, you know, like it's such a shit show when you're at Ebisu oh, and all this stuff on. and all this stuff. And he's helping me and doing all this stuff. And then just one day he's like at Hoonigan. I'm like, how did that happen? And it's just like you're over there building stuff. I'm like, that's Life's cool weird. as hell. Life's weird. Just keep doing yeah. weird stuff and you'll get somewhere. But it's so exciting for me to see all these people. Like you were at my drift events more than a decade ago. Yes. And then, you know, seeing you at Ebisu. And I didn't connect those two things because if you remember that weekend, all of us were like yeah, dead. dead tired. That was oh. a brutal weekend. Your, your car got smoked. I remember that. You got annihilated really? on the entry. Oh, was I throwing backies and the dude drove straight into me? <laughs> dude, I remember that. It, I, push your... I didn't... The, I, I, I went and like 30 seconds later, someone left from the line. Nailed. And I threw the car into a backy, and then he just drove down the straight. This is the it's time. It's like 100 right? mile an hour. Yeah, it's 100 mile an hour. <laughs> entry, I'm throwing the car, and he just drives down the straight, sees me, and then enters, and then like hits me like 10 seconds later. So yeah, like five, he, I, I think don't he even freaked remember. out, straightened out, and just oh, nose bombed you. Oh my God. That car's still alive. Aaron's pretty chill, but he was mad that day. <laughs> yeah. Well, because that person could kill someone. Yeah. Because yeah. we weren't tandeming. I mean, there there was probably ten seconds between well, us. Well, I think you the said line. no tandem because you were gonna try something stupid. Yeah. I and then I just got beans. <laughs> I remember like I remember blacking out. Like my head got it hit was, that hard. It was hard. We all stopped. We were like, holy shit. Yeah. Yeah. I got dumber that day. <laughs> yeah. And now here we are. Yeah. All right. Thanks so much. Oh, we're gonna shake hands we're gonna like shake adults. Hands. Adults. We're at Hoonigan, we're not adults. Yeah. We're doing burnouts. High fives happened earlier. Now I'm just tired. All right, I hope the mic was plugged in. And thank you to the Drift Week sponsors, starting the BC Racing Custom Coilovers. The Lone Star Drift Channel would not be anything like what it is today without these guys, so thank you for supporting us for so long. Thank you to Drift HQ for bringing out all the spare parts for Drift Week. Couldn't do this without you guys. And the fancy trailer that you have, the welding equipment that you keep the cars on track with, the mechanics that help, Duarte and the whole crew, thank you so much. Thank you to Y Play Imports. If you need a JZX100 or something imported from Japan, get with them. The prices are only going up, so you better get with Y Play Imports. Ask for Trenton over there. Thank you to What Monsters Do and NK Wheels. I have been running NK Wheels for more than, I think, 15 years. And if you would like to get some cool merch over on whatmonstersdo.com, there's a 20% off discount code. It is EBISU, E-B-I-S-U. And of course, thank you to ECU Master. They support the best drifter in the world right now, James Dean. That might be an arguable thing, I'm not sure. And they have tons of awesome standalone ECU equipment. They have digital dashes, they have sensors, they have all kinds of stuff. They have been specializing in Jay-Z's and all kinds of other products. They have patch harnesses for stuff that's common. Check out their website and see all the rad stuff they have that you could buy. And support the sponsors that support us. Thank you.